Speak to me. Swedish film director Ingmar Bergman whispered those words while standing next to a portrait of Jesus in a cathedral in Europe. He waited for a long, long time, but he encountered only dead silence. And the experience was motivation for Bergman's movie, Silence. The movie portrayed people who despaired in finding God. Bergman's conclusion was that in our world, we only hear ourselves and that there's no voice that comes to us from outside the universe. You all know, and you very well might remember that there was a time when there was a general acceptance in our country of the idea that the Bible had authority. The Bible had authority at the, as the word of God. That God spoke words of authority. Human beings should internalize those words and follow those words. You also know that that day has long passed. So our culture now experiences the natural results of what happens when humanism has been the dominant philosophical thought for over a century. There was a biology friend of Darwin's named T.H. Huxley. And he wrote in 1890 that he visualized the day when faith would be separated from fact, and then faith would go on triumphantly forever. Of course, he was being very sarcastic and snide about faith going on forever. To him, that was a joke, because in his mind, it would be up to each individual to, to choose whatever faith he or she wanted to choose. Nancy Piercy has written a book called Total Truth. She asserts that postmodern thinking has drawn a line of division between public and private, between facts and values, or secular and sacred. She calls the division the single most potent weapon for delegitimizing the biblical perspective in the public square. She explains that secularists put religion into the values category, taking it out of the realm of what is true and what is false. So then secularists can assure us that, of course, they respect religion, but at the same time denying that it has any relevance. So when truth is removed from the equation, faith is relegated to the area of feelings. And one person's feelings are just, another, just as valid as another person's feelings. So today it is rare to be asked if one's spiritual beliefs are true. The more frequent question is, are your spiritual values meaningful? We have descended from the idea that everyone has a right to his opinion to the idea that everyone's opinion is equally right. So as long as no one asks whether a belief is true, there can be as many faiths as there are people in the world. As a result, our culture offers a huge menu of religious options and assures us that they differ only in minor matters. We're invited to stand in front of a smorgasbord and choose whatever is just right for us. And the idea that there could be one book from God that judges all other religions as well is an idea that is discounted as the utmost of narrow-minded bigotry. And of course, we deal in the 21st century with a different form of atheism. In previous centuries, we dealt with atheism as a value system of the just the outright rejection of God. But we're now in a century where atheism has taken on a far more voraciously angry, uh, uh, aggressive tone to the point that it maligns God-fearing opponents as deranged, deluded, and even evil. Oh, wow. So it wants to free the world of religion, while at the same time, it almost, it does look like a religion itself. So into that world comes us, where we believe Christianity claims to have a special revealed wisdom from outside this world. that sets it apart from naturalistic religions. There's Hinduism, Buddhism, and a host of New Age options that are based on the insights of gurus, prophets, and enlightened leaders. But we believe that God has left a trustworthy revelation, and he tells us how to be brought back to him. 
We believe that God has revealed these truths and the most enlightened prophet could never discover them on his own. We believe that God personally sent us letters containing information about him and his relationship to the world. We believe that we have the most important answers to the most important questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? But can I prove, prove that the Bible is the word of God? The answer depends on how we define proof. Because no matter how much evidence is presented, there will always be room, there always must be room for a measure of faith. Erwin Lutzer wrote about a friend who said he saw a beautiful house standing opposite Mount Blanc on the border between France and Switzerland. And what puzzled him was that the shutters on the windows facing that beautiful mountain were always closed. And he went on to say, no matter how remarkable the Bible is, it will not appeal unless it's given an honest hearing. At the end of the day, in part, whether we believe depends on whether or not we're willing to fling the shutters open and see what's before us. So for the next few weeks, what I'm hoping to do between now and Super Bowl Sunday is fling the shutter doors open and to look at a few things that I hope will increase uh, confidence in the Bible being the authentic word of God. Before we do that, um, and by the, by the way, I just want to tell you again that there'll be a lot of discussion in future weeks, so if you just endure that soliloquy and you're thinking, oh my goodness, um, I promise we'll, have, we'll be a lot more engaged in the few weeks ahead and a little bit more tonight. Um, what I want us to do for the next few minutes, though, is focus our energy tonight on defining a term that is going to be one of the most important terms we'll talk about for the next uh, four weeks or so. And that term is inspiration. So let's start with you. When you hear that the Bible is the word of God, that the word is inspired by God, what does that mean to you? Directed, God. All right, God directed, okay. God defined. All right, God directed, God defined. All right, good. God breathed. God breathed. And we're going to, we're going to do a deep dive into God breathed next week, by the way. Okay. Trustworthy. Good. Trustworthy. God directed, God breathed. Trustworthy. God said it. He said, he, he said it. Mm -hmm. All right. From the actual lips of God. Mm -hmm. uh, he okay. speaks. Mm -hmm. um, I know Irvon, I mentioned this a while back, but um, and I was looking for that sheet um, to give to my neighbor. Um, I kept it on my mirror for probably years. That, um, I think it was in one of our bulletin, and I need to ask Wendy. It's anyway, it says, God speaks, God speaks, God speaks. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and um, I don't, when my neighbor was talking about something, uh, she uh, texted me and um, we texted each other that night. She said, you know, um, God is, uh, you know, something she was going to do. And she said, God is uh, telling a different and I wanted to find that so I can give it to her and, and explain to her, you know, that, well, if God is talking to you, you need, really need to listen. And, I, and I'm speaking for myself also. Mary, it was interesting. Uh, Irvon brought that up in our Tuesday class, uh, that, mm -hmm. that, very, uh, that very thing from, uh, from Wendy back, back in the bulletin. All right. You, gave, you laid a perfect foundation. Uh, in so many ways for inspiration. I want to spend just a, a very few minutes uh, reviewing with you some things that uh, inspiration is not, and then we'll get more into different types of inspiration. Uh, two or three things that inspiration is not. 
Uh, number one, inspiration does not mean that the entire Bible was given to people who were nothing more than secretaries. Uh, the writers of the Bible were not always passive. Scribes were always passive. Inspired writers often participated. And we will get more into some different ways they participated in the process um, mm -hmm. as we go through um, our classes over the next two or three weeks. Um, the authors of the Bible used a lot of different styles a lot of different organization and a, actually a lot of different uh, types of grammar. When you think uh, of Paul, how would you describe his, uh, how would you describe his writing style? Direct. Very direct, okay. In a lot of ways he's speaking from his experience. Okay, a, a lot from life experience, and we're going to drill down on that, Mary. Very good, very good point. All right, so we've we've got direct, uh, we've got uh, some experience. Okay, authoritative, absolutely authoritative, uh, for the most part. Uh, remember, in Philemon was the one exception when he appealed in a little different way. Which, which was totally different than the way he wrote uh, First and Second Corinthians mm -hmm. for, from different perspectives. Um, Tracy, did, was your hand up? It was one of your first question. Sorry. <laughs> I, gotta get, I gotta get back used to look, watching better. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Go ahead, Ron. Oh, um, I think with with Paul, <clears throat> he wrote with urgency Ooh. because Paul had been educated and his whole life had been to serve God, but he did not believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Right. Until God spoke to him personally. So after that, he came from a different perspective than anybody else, in, in my opinion. It was very, very, very vital to him that he get this across. This is a message you cannot not listen to. Okay. So there's, there's a level of urgency uh, in Paul's writing. There's a level of direct. Uh, there's a level of authority. Um, you've probably thought, you've probably seen so far uh, in your own readings, especially in Romans, that, that the logic is just brilliant. Uh, the, way he, the way he can take something from so many different angles uh, to make his point. Um, he's very precise uh, in his grammar. Now, how would you contrast that with Mark? Hmm. Mark was more emotional. He was very much more emotional, okay? Uh, he used a lot of very vivid imagery uh, his grammar was not the best, um, at least from from a from a precision standpoint, like Paul's might have been. He wrote with with a, uh, while Paul wrote with a with a certain level of urgency. Uh, Mark wrote with a little with a with a similar passion, but it just had a little different flavor. Okay. Um, the point I'm making is that. Paul wrote a little differently from Mark. Mark wrote definitely, he wrote a lot differently from Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote radically differently from John. That's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, whereas John has a, has a totally different uh, focus and, and, and tone. The point I'm making is, is, is that God, through inspiration, take, takes human beings where they are 
and, and he uses them where they are to account to to project the message that God intends to project. So he doesn't turn Paul into Mark to, to give his message. Paul writes within the confines of Paul's skill set and personality, yet it still has inspiration uh, from God. So um, so let's um, let's drill down on on that idea uh, just a little bit. Uh, three types of inspiration. There are things that are learned through ordinary means. Um, for example, if you look at Luke chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, you find out that Luke did very careful and meticulous research before writing his account on the life of Jesus. Um, he recorded what he researched. He recorded what he saw. Is God's hand in that? Absolutely. But Luke learns a lot of these things by observation. And then another way is that God endows authors with ideas that they can put into their own words. Uh, we just we referenced Paul just a few moments ago as he was speaking in the book of Romans. Um, Paul's theological arguments in his epistles would be an example of God endowing authors with the ideas they can put in their own words. Now, there are times when dictation did take place. You remember when uh, God met Moses on the mountain and, and Ten Commandments, actually God, God wrote his feet, God actually with his finger, if you'll look at that, um, the Ten Commandments were directly dictated. And there were also messages that God directly dictated to the prophets. Now, there's three different ways there, but I, but I want you to think about this. Does it de negate divine authorship if the writer's allowed to use his own style or if he writes things he already knew about? Does that negate inspiration? No. Uh, Absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. Because if God wishes to speak to us, it's easy to believe he could be sovereign over how those words are spoken to us. He can speak to us any way he wants to speak to us. And for us to, for us to, to question that is to kind of put God into our own box about, about what we think God will or will not do. So, um, so God can, can convey his inspired message through a, a wide variety of means, and yet it still be inspired. Now that leads me to, to, a, to a statement that I want you to comment on for me. So a comment on this quote for me. If the Bible was penned by humans, it must be imperfect because humans are imperfect. What do you think? I think that's the whole whole idea of inspiration. God used fallible people to write his perfect word, and he was able to do it by his power. So part of the part of the wonder is that God would use human beings to accomplish this. Okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Along with that is just believing. I mean, yes, they were human, but we we have to believe truly. Although they were human, God led them to do what they were doing. And if you don't believe that, then you're gonna always think of them as just mere humans. Okay. Am I making sense? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Very so, good. Can an imperfect person make a perfect statement? Sure. sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, George Washington was the first president of the United States. I don't know everything about history, but I can say that and know that to be a true, accurate statement, a perfect statement, even though I am an imperfect person. So imperfect people can make perfect statements especially if they are directed by a perfect God. Let's talk a little bit more about dual authorship. 
John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Verse 14, the word became flesh. Um, I started to say we understand that. On a certain level, we do. On a certain level, it's a mystery that, that, we, that we absorb and we believe and we, we seek to, to understand deeper the rest of our lives. In the same way, God's word is divine, yet it is recorded by human beings. So just as Jesus was fully divine and fully human, the word of God can be divine, yet recorded by humans. And part of the wonder is what Troy referenced just a few moments ago, is the wonder that God would choose human beings to record his message. Now, let's, let's drill down just a little bit more. What does it mean for something to be infallible or inerrant? Infallible or inerrant? Uh, what does that mean? I can't see all of you right now, so somebody just speak. It's tested and proven. All right, tested and tried. All right, and proven. Okay. Never wrong. Never wrong. All right, critical. Okay. Uncontestable. Uncontestable. It's a good word. It's a real good word. Okay. So it means even more than being free from error. Um, it's possible to write a history of Rome and it be accurate, but it's not necessarily inspired. Infallible or inerrant even goes a step further. Um, I'm going to tee you up for something we're going to talk a lot about next week. The Bible is not only accurate, it's the very breath of God. And that means it carries an authority that's unlike any other book. So with inerrancy, we've got faithful representation. That does not mean that the entire conversation was given to us. Remember, John said at the end of his writing that if he were to, if he were to have written everything that Jesus did or said while he walked the earth, all the volumes of the world wouldn't have been sufficient uh, to, to take all of that in. So... Inerrancy has an aspect of faithful representation of the content. Now, um, let's look at an example of this. If you'll, um, I assume you got, got Bibles close by. Uh, let's look at the uh, Sermon on the Mount in a couple of different angles. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 first. Hey, Mike, I found something that said uh, perfect with respect to purpose. So the word being perfect based on the purpose that it was, that it needed to be. I'm writing that, I'm writing that down because the next time I teach this, I'm going to want to steal that. Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, some, as a teacher, before I taught math, sometimes I've had essay questions and so forth uh, that I would have, have a student write. Um, uh, oftentimes, students will write uh, a, a perfect essay, but it's not about the right thing. <laughs> yeah. So you can say, you can say uh, things that don't have mistakes in them, but if they don't accomplish the purpose for which it's written, then it, it doesn't do any good, you know, so... I think you have to add that into it, kind of bounce off what Gary was talking about. It, that's, um, it, it, that is an excellent, excellent point. Um, excellent point. Um, I was actually a victim of that in high school one time. I wrote, wrote what I thought was a brilliant essay, but it didn't answer the question. I learned a very valuable lesson. I learned a D lesson, uh, but I learned a very valuable lesson that I remember a year or two later. Um, Matthew chapter 3, uh, Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, uh, Beatitudes, uh, verse 3. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All right. Let's move forward now to see something in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and I thought I was going to begin somewhere that I'm going to, I'm going to change. All right. Let's look in verse 20. Looking at his disciples, this is what Jesus said. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven, for that's how the ancestors treated their prophets. Now, verse 24. Woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well, well fed now, for you'll go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that's how their ancestors treated the false prophets. All right. Here's my question. Do Matthew and Luke agree with each other or do they disagree with each other in the representation of what Jesus said when, according to Luke chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 5, he went on to a mountainside and, and spoke? Do we agree or do we disagree between Matthew and Luke? I think we agree. Two people stating the same thing in a different way. Like you would probably say things one way and I'd say them another. And I think that's what was going on here with Luke and with Matthew. They were just two different people telling basically the same story in different words. That is so important for us to understand when we, on the, at least on one level, come across what are alleged to be contradictions. That Matthew can write about the things that um, he saw and he spoke it one way. Luke can, can speak things uh, a little differently. They're at the same event. They see the same thing. It has the same flavor. Um, part of the beauty of scripture is that the Holy Spirit leaves us more than one account of the gospel of Jesus so that we can see Jesus from more than one person's, uh, though inspired, perspective. So part of the beauty of the gospels is that we see Jesus from the perspective of a doctor. We see Jesus from the perspective of a passionate uh, mark. We see Jesus from the perspective of a tax collector. And we see Jesus from the perspective of one who loved him like no other. So part of the beauty of the text is that we, we are able to see uh, Jesus from these different angles. And it might not always say word for word the exact thing. Yet we know that we are getting truth and we're getting little different nuances uh, of it. So, um, so what's the difference between the question... The Bible is inspired, and the Bible is inspiring. What's the difference between those two statements? The Bible is inspired, and the Bible is inspiring. I think that's the difference between the source and the target. All right. What do you mean, Jeannie, source and target? Um, source is is where the Bible came from. Um, it's inspiring though refers to impact. Okay. On, on targets. All right, source versus target. I, I like the way you differentiated that. All right. Um, Jack, what were you, 
Uh, were you going to say something? I thought I heard your voice. Come off mute, brother. There okay. we go. Um, I, was, I was thinking it might be have something to do with tense. One being more of a future tense, maybe, and the other being a present tense. Okay. All right. Being inspired implies in the future, maybe. Okay. So hopefully inspiring, we're looking for a future, we're looking for a result. Okay. Right. All right. And inspired, you kind of have the result. Okay. So the the what I want to make sure we do get out of this is that the question of inspired is not necessarily how exciting a message is and how we feel about a message. Inspired is, is it true? Um, do we know that it comes with God's authoritative signature? Um, let's talk about one other thing that inspiration uh, does not mean. That, that you're all going to agree with, but I just think we need to articulate it and think it through for a moment or two. One thing that inspiration does not mean is that the Bible could be correct in matters of doctrine, but incorrect in matters of science and history. Here's what I mean by that. Yeah. You can't really separate that. You can't say... Well, I'll give you an example. If you ask the question, is the resurrection a historical fact or is it a doctrinal truth? The answer to that question would be yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The Bible is not a history book. Yes. The Bible's purpose yes. is not history. Yes, the book. Thing. But you will find historical accuracy. The Bible is not a, the Bible's purpose is not science, but you will find scientific accuracy. We must be careful in how we interpret, especially when we go to uh, the language of Psalms and Proverbs and try to proof text things about creation when the language is the language of emotion. Um, and sometimes uh, descriptive words are used. Let me give you an example. The Bible in several places speaks of a sunrise. All right. Uh, scientifically, does the sun rise and set? Mm -hmm. Yes. Scientific. No. Okay. So science has taught us that the sun what? really doesn't rise and set. The sun doesn't rotate around the earth. We, we all know that. However, when the Bible uses descriptive language about sunrise and sunset, the reason y'all just said, well, yes, is because every night on the news, uh, when it comes to weather time, what you hear is the time for sunrise and sunset. And if you were to go to any, uh, any year's almanac, what you would find is sunrise and sunset, but you would never call a sun, you would never call an almanac anti-science or bogus science or fake science just because it says sunrise and sunset. In other words, the Bible contains some descriptive words just like something like an almanac uh, uh, might do. Okay, um, I wanna introduce you to, uh, to this thought um, I'm gonna pull the uh, the share back up because I, I want you to be able to uh, to see a couple of things here. Um, you're gonna have access to the PowerPoint that I'm showing tonight if you so choose. You'll just need to uh, to let me know. Um, there's a lot of question today about textual variations, and would not textual variations prove that we can't not we can't know for sure we're holding the real thing because there's so many textual variations out there. So I want to speak to that briefly, and then we'll we again we'll do a little bit of a deep dive on this as we go through the class. Um, manuscripts of the Bible. 
were extremely carefully copied. And from those copies, additional copies were made. Some copies were made in the, some lang in the same language, some in others. Today, we have thousands of copies of various ages. And inevitably, there are some variations, especially among later manuscripts. Most of them have to do with spelling and word order. The good news on the variations is that we know each variation. It can be evaluated based on scholarship and comparison. So we're not flying blind. Um, I love these words from Bernard Rahm. I want you to consider. In reference to the Old Testament, we know that the Jews preserved it, at it as no other manuscript has ever been preserved. They kept tabs on every letter, every syllable, every word, and every paragraph. They had special classes of men within their culture whose sole duty was to preserve and transmit these documents with practically perfect fidelity. They were scribes, they were lawyers, masserets, whoever, I love this, whoever counted the syllables of Plato or Aristotle. Um, I love that a quote. Here are some things that we do have. We have more than 5,700 known Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. We have over 10,000 copies of Latin Vulgate manuscripts and at least 9,300 other early manuscripts. Altogether, we have nearly 25,000 manuscript copies of portions of the New Testament. Now, why does that matter? No other document of antiquity even comes close. Here are some examples. The earliest manuscripts of Plato that we have are 1300 years after his death. Mm. For Sophocles, we have 100 copies and the earliest manuscript is 1400 years after his death. Mm. The New Testament by contrast the earliest manuscripts we have are from the second century, a uh, hundred years or less uh, afterward. All right, so one more thing to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. Here are some, here are some questions that we're gonna talk about over the next uh, several weeks. And, and that way you can find out uh, what, um, which of these are, are most interesting to you. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the questions you're gonna see on the screen for the next few minutes. And if you do not see a question when it comes to trusting the Bible that you're interested in, send me a text or send me an email, okay? But here are some things, at least right now, that I'm planning for us to uh, talk about. Um, one thing we'll plan to discuss is this. Isn't it illogical to say that the Bible is the word of God just because it claims it is the word of God? In other words, circular argument. The uh, Bible says it's the word of God. Um, it is because it is because it is. Um, we'll we'll uh, deal with some of the logic of that um, as we go. Uh, can we trust the history of the Bible? Uh, what about miracles? Uh, do the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, really matter? Uh, to what extent uh, can we believe Bible prophecies? Um, couldn't the disciples have made up the stories about Jesus? We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, we are going to do a, uh, not a, not a lake deep, I'm trying to find a way to describe it. We're not going to spend 20 weeks talking about science, so I don't want to promise you like a deep, 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 deep dive, but we are going to talk about science and in contradiction with the Bible. Um, here's one we are going to talk about who decided what book mm -hmm. should be in the Bible mm -hmm. and how were some of those decisions made, when were some of those decisions made. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Gospel of Thomas and some other lost books. Yeah. We'll talk about what the Bible teaches that no other book teaches, and then we'll talk about what benefits come to those who study the Bible. 
if on that list um, you did not see the thing that you are interested in, that you either want to discuss or you want to share, um, if you would uh, send me an email or send me send me a text, um, I'll be glad to see how how we can uh, incorporate that in uh, one of these weeks between now and Super Bowl uh, Sunday. I want to leave you with this tonight. Uh, we'll get out a minute or two early tonight, but don't count. Don't hold me to that for future. All right. Uh, but um, I want to leave you with this thought, and, and this was uh, shamelessly stolen from another preacher. Uh, his name is Robert Chapman, but I, I want to share these words with you. Speaking of the Bible, this is what he says. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food <clears throat> to support you, comfort to cheer you. It's a traveler's map, a pilgrim's staff, a pilot's compass, a soldier's sword, and a Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored, heaven is opened, and the gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is the grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its ultimate end. It should fill the memory, test the heart, and guide the feet. So read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life. It will be open at the judgment. It will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and condemns those who would trifle with its contents. Irvon, uh, Tonight, you are the one that gets to have the official last word. <laughs> okay. He, he knows I won't give up. Uh, that that you just said is the inspiration for God speaks, God speaks, God speaks, God speaks. Are you listening? Absolutely. Only let, God's word is only limited by the amount of attention we pay to it and the amount that we live it. That's why it needs to be the final word. Perfectly said. Very well said. Thank you. <laughs> Gary Eaton, hello, sir. Would you lead us in a final prayer tonight, please, sir? Yes, sir. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come together uh, to be with fellow Christians, to learn more about your word, to learn more about why we study your word. We thank you for Mike and for the preparation that he puts into these classes. And we pray that you will be with him and that uh, the message that he provides to us will be uplifting uh, so that we can see you in a clearer path. Dear God, we pray for those that were mentioned earlier with health concerns. We pray your blessings upon them. Uh, we know that there are others that were not mentioned. We pray that you will be with them as well. You know in our hearts who is of concern for us and who we're praying for personally. Be with us throughout this week until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Next week, our steps will be um, the unity of Scripture and what Scripture says about itself. So, um, Bibles in our laps. We'll we'll be we'll be looking at a multiplicity of Scriptures next week. But uh, that's where we'll start, and we'll uh, continue the journey. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for being here tonight. I appreciate you hanging with me. Um, if, if you're blessed, uh, wonderful. If you weren't blessed. 
if you need something different, tell me you need something different, okay? Because I'm I'm here to bless, or I'm here really to serve you. So if it's not going in a way that that's really helpful to you, send me a note, and, and I'm you won't hurt my feelings at all. Ultimately, what we're after is to grow together and to learn and stretch and and move forward. So, thanks to all of you. Have a hope you have a great week and and love all of you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Mike. Good job. Get it. Now, if I did away with this. Yeah.